Thank you very much, uh, Professor Dorn. <coughs> Thank you very much to the UBS uh, Center for Economic and Society for inviting me today to discuss this question presented by Professor Dorn of uh, big uh, superstars in the economic life. And uh, as a Commissioner for Competition from uh, the end of 2009 till the beginning, till the end of 2014, I was used to deal with this uh, question, but in particular, in my period, I was used to discover a new category of superstar firms that were the big tech platforms, the Google, Apple, uh, Amazon, and so on and so forth. And what is the difference between this sector, the big tech platforms that emerge with the digital economy in the uh, decade of the 90s and grew a lot during the uh, first two decades of this century. What is the difference between the market power of these big techs and the general analysis that Professor Dorn presented? In my view, is that the excessive power of big techs goes beyond economics. It's not only about market power, it's also about innovation, what is going on with innovation in the digital sector thanks to the activity of these uh, big techs that they will analyze, privacy, how our rights to protect our privacy are respected or not in this uh, period of a uh, big emergence of uh, superstars in the digital uh, activities, what is going on with illegal content circulating through the network, through internet, and in particular circulating through these uh, big platforms, not only through big platforms, but the big platforms occupies a very high percentage of the total activity going through the network, the political interferences, and so on. So the debate does not only affect our economy, that of course, but in particular affects the digital economy and the consequences of this goes beyond economics. So I will elaborate in uh, how competition policy, how competition law and competition economic analysis are contributing to this uh, debate, to this reflection, and I will use a sentence pronounced by my successor as Commissioner for Competition, the then uh, Vice President of the European Commission, Margrethe Vestager, who said, rules are needed to put order in this chaos. These are Vestager's words, not my own words, but I fully agree with this. We need rules, and probably, and I will discuss it, competition policy rules that are with us in Europe, but also in the US and in many other jurisdictions for decades, how those rules that have not basically changed, for instance, in the EU, the present legal rules at the treaty level are more or less the same that in the Treaty of Rome in the mid-50s of past century, to what extent those rules can cope with the present challenges in the digital economy and what is needed to make competition policy enforcement really efficient in these new situations. As you know, probably, the uh, competition policy enforcement has three main areas of activity. The fight against cartels and illegal agreements among companies. The uh, fight against abuses of dominant positions of companies in the market. Not pursuing dominance, but pursuing the abuses based on this uh, market power of uh, dominance in the market, and control of mergers, of mergers and acquisitions, of uh, acquisitions of companies or merger between two companies operating in the same or in similar markets to increase the size and to increase efficiencies. In Europe, in the EU, we also have a state aid control, but is not uh, object 
of my analysis this morning. The digital economy accelerates, accelerates existing trends towards a higher degree of market concentration. As we've seen in the PowerPoint presented by Professor Don, this is not new, but in fact, the degree of concentration is increasing in many markets and the digital economy or the digital use of software, of technologies in other sectors can contribute and in my view is contributing to the acceleration of this, uh, of this process. This means that uh, competition policy with the traditional instruments has a risk of under-enforcement both in the fight against abuses in the market as well as in the control of mergers and acquisitions. And at the same time, it's not only this under-enforcement because of the new developments in the market, but because the investigations of potential abuses, of the analysis about the consequences of a potential merger, has become more complex and more cumbersome being the nature of the digital economy. So the question is what to do. We have started really to think about this at the EU level in 2010, when we received at the Commission some complaints regarding the Google activities. Google according to the complainants, or some of the complainants, were discriminating potential competitors when going as user of Google to the search to put queries to be responded by the Google search engine. Google was scrapping contents from some media, for instance, to present uh, summaries of the contents prepared by media through the Google News activities. Google had potential abuses in the use of ads with an increased participation of digital ads in the total market of publicity, and Google at that time was the most important uh, firm operating in this market. So there were several complaints in 2009, 2010, of a different nature, looking at different potential abuses. So we started a formal investigation in November 2010, 12 years ago. It was a very complex case, so I decided to try to get an agreement with Google. This is uh, foreseen in the regulations operating in the EU. If you reach an agreement with a company that is being investigated and the company put forward possible solutions to the abuses, and these solutions are considered the right ones to eliminate abuses, you can reach an agreement with the company and to make these commitments presented by the company as legally binding. So it's a kind of regulation through an indirect way to regulate a particular market. But these uh, conversations with Google were not successful, several rounds, three rounds of uh, negotiations with them to try to uh, receive better implementing solutions for the abuses were under investigation, was not possible, and finally, my successor arrived knowing that the negotiations with Google had not been successful, and she decided to launch a formal investigation to prohibit these activities. Finally, a decision was adopted in 27, I think, with uh, a prohibition of part of the abuses that were subject to investigations, the shopping, uh, uh, Google shopping uh, system offered by Google, that was enjoying in the search engine a much better treatment than the shopping services offered by competitors of Google. The Commission prohibited this uh, abuse and imposed a fine of 2.4 billion euros, the equivalent of 
Swiss francs, more or less. Google, of course, appeared before the court, and in 2021, so three and a half years later, the Court of Justice in Luxembourg, in the first instance, supported the Commission decision to prohibit these practices and consolidated the fine of 2.4 billion euros, more or less. Since then, the Commission at the EU level has opened investigations and adopted some other decisions against Google, for instance, against some practices of Android that has become the dominant uh, ecosystem for smartphones and tablets owned by Google, and uh, another kind of investigations against Amazon, uh, Apple, and other digital firms. But there is not the only problem we consider. The uh, economists of competition had created a new concept. Analyzing mergers, they talked about killer acquisitions. So these big tech platforms, on the one hand, they are very efficient and they have organic growth because of its efficiency and its uh, competitiveness vis-a-vis -vis others, indeed, I will not deny this, but at the same time, Google, Apple, Microsoft, uh, Amazon, and others, but in particular these big ones, Facebook, they acquired around 500 firms because they consider that was good for their businesses, but was good in many cases because they were acquiring competitors or even potential competitors, and because the size of the companies acquired by these big techs, the merger control rules were not working well, and most of these uh, mergers were considered not uh, uh, infractions to the competition rules because the authorities cannot demonstrate the reduction of competition because of these acquisitions. So these killer acquisitions had become also a very important factor to increase the size of the platforms, but at the same time to eliminate competitors because of these uh, acquisitions. So, this is not only a case-by-case -case, uh, reflection. Of course, the Commission and other competition authorities use these experiences of receiving complaints, opening investigations, looking into the nature of the markets, the barriers uh, to enter into the markets, the abuses, etc., to improve their knowledge on how the digital economy is working. But the Commission decided at the EU level to uh, require a report from experts. And this was not only the EU Commission, also the British Authority, the Australian Authority, some uh, people in the US. In the last uh, years of past decade, launched investigations to better understand the nature of this uh, market in the digital economy. There was a need to understand how digitization is transforming the way markets operate and companies operate. And the questions were, in particular, two big questions submitted to the experts. Do the present EU competition rules at the EU level are still valid, yes or not? And in any case, regardless of the rules, is enough to adapt enforcement practices, the traditional practices of competition authorities, to cope with digital markets and digital platforms, yes or not. The Commission report, published in 2009, said, sorry, 2019, said, digitization is the origin of new markets, new players, and new business models. And some of these digital services offered by these big platforms are provided at zero price. When we click into Google search, we are not paying a price for this. When we look at the Google Maps, we are not paying a price. When we uh, register 
and Twitter. We are not paying a price, so on and so forth. But we are offering these big platforms our data. And the data we offer to the platforms is the main asset they have once processed, once integrated in a big databases, and databases that are growing more and more every day, given that users, thousands of users, millions of users every day are clicking, are uh, operating through platforms, offering the platforms our data, where we live, where we eat, what are our cultural uh, preferences, etc., etc. They can know almost everything about us, and this is a big asset to offer new services to those who they know sometimes better than ourselves about our preferences, our priorities, the direction of our expenditures, etc. Of course, this is not only a very important economic asset, this presents also some risks. This enormous amount of data can affect privacy, can be sold to buyers that can try to use this data for not legal purposes, and this can give way even to political interferences, as we've seen uh, famously in one of the last uh, EU, uh, US electoral campaigns. Sometimes the uh, competition enforcement needs to address the power of big online platforms that are acting at the same time as referees, as owners of a platform, and players, because based on the, its ownership of this platform, built on our, base, on our database, they can create new services that they can uh, monetize. It's not only to monetize their businesses through ads, through digital ads, but it is also to monetize their database through the creation of new services that can compete sometimes with a non-level playing field, given the size of this database, against competitors that try to introduce their services in the same markets that cannot compete with a, legal, with a level playing field. So, these are the uh, main uh, features of the digital economy, according to the report requested by the EU Commission, but according to other reports that are not very different in their analysis and in their conclusions. The data are a vital tool, indeed, that plays in favor of the biggest, because the biggest is a database, the more efficient can become for the use of the owner of this uh, database to create new services or to compete without the level playing field against new entrants. These databases offers for them enormous economies of scope. They can diversify their activities thanks to the base of data that they built at the beginning, that is growing and growing with snowball effects. There are high returns of scale, of course, the database uh, owned by platforms creates uh, powerful network externalities. The costs uh, are less than proportionate to the number of customers served. And this creates a trend in this economy, not only in this economy, but in particular, in my view, in the digital economy with the big platforms, for a model where the winner takes all the market. It's a fight for the market. It's not a fight within the market. On top of this, we know by experience that not always is easy to switch from one platform to another platform, continue receiving the same uh, kind of services that we receive in the original platform when we are uh, registered or we are using as customers. Switching is often difficult, and there are barriers for this switch from one platform to another. And 
the large incumbents, the big techs, are very difficult to be dislodged, to go from number one to number two, number three, or number four. It's very, very difficult. And from the economic analysis point of view, we know that the markets does not always self-correct their imperfections. And in particular, this principle applies to the digital markets. Even if incumbents does not engage in particular abuses of its dominant position, there may be a tendency to persistent and growing market power. Even if they don't abuse of this market power, the internal dynamics of these markets goes them an increased power day after day. Some uh, people say the big tech, the big platforms are natural monopolies. As they were in the past, the production of uh, electricity or the production of, uh, of uh, gas or whatever energy source or uh, as it was the case with railways and other state monopolies of the past uh, century, or others use a concept that was analyzed during the period of the liberalization of network industries in the 80s past century of essential facilities, that as an essential facility, a big platform, some people say, has a duty to deal with the competitors, not to put barriers to their competitors, in using the platform for their own businesses and for their own purposes. In other cases, there are uh, proposals for these big platforms to self-regulate their activities. Some public authorities say it's too complex for us, let's ask them to self-regulate. And some of the owners of the leaders of these platforms says, no, no, it's very complex for us, this will create for us a lot of problems. Let's ask the public authorities to regulate our activities, being careful not to kill innovation. But what to do if, apart this uh, general analysis, there are some behavioral biases? As a, a professor of uh, Universidad Pompeu Fabra in Barcelona, Massimo Mota, described there are some behavioral biases, for instance, for the users tend to use the pre-installed apps in their smartphones or tablets, not to look for alternatives for the apps that are pre-installed when you buy the, the device. There is a, a question of prominence that users don't go beyond the first search results in the uh, Google first page of the search engine, you can find almost everything you need to respond to your query and don't go to the page two, three or four because nobody does. Almost nobody goes beyond the first uh, search. We are a little bit lazy as users and we don't cancel automatic renewables or subscriptions or we agree to give away our privacy rights because we have no time to read all the conditions that are published in the uh, screen of our smartphones or our devices, and we say, okay, let's accept the uh, message that the owners of the platform are sending to us. So, all these biases create trends in favor of incumbents. So, it's not only about the nature of the markets, this network externality as a economies of scale and scope, is also about the biases of the users, that with our behavior, we tend to act in favor of uh, the big uh, incumbents. So, as a consequence of this uh, analysis, in case by case, or in the, in the reports requested by the EU Commission and others, some regulatory initiatives came up. And in particular, in the EU, uh, we have two new regulations, so EU laws of direct application in the EU member states. One, the Digital Services Act, 
that I will define very quickly, and the other one, the Digital Markets Act, to look into the way these markets function and to combine the traditional antitrust ex post investigations, once complaints have been received or once the analysis has discovered some potential abuses, but at the same time to have regulations that will ex ante prevent the existence of abuses or will forbid the abuses that can be operated by the uh, platforms. The EU was very well known some years ago with the regulation of uh, data, the data protection regulation that has been considered, analyzed, and sometimes also copied beyond the borders of the EU. The Digital Markets Act will come into force in the next months. The D Digital Services Act regarding the content will take full effect in 2024. This uh, regulation, da data protection, came into force in 2016. The EU recently adopted a Data Governance Act in May 22, May this year, to facilitate data sharing among companies. They uh, proposed in February this year a Data Act to harmonize rules on the fair access to data. And they also issued a proposal last year on artificial intelligence that is being considered. But I will refer, before I conclude my presentation, to these two regulations, these two EU laws that are coming into force after the discussions that uh, happened in the last uh, couple of years. The Digital Services Act pretends to counter illegal products, services, and content circulating through the network. And at the same time, protecting this uh, 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 content from illegal activities, the Digital Services Act intends to foster innovation, growth and competitiveness against the argument that regulations of these activities can kill innovation as has been provided indeed by these uh, big platforms over the last uh, decades, two decades, but the that Digital Services Act wants to take care also to the protection of innovation, not to kill innovation because of the issue of new regulations on content. They try to facilitate scaling up of smaller platforms. They tend to rebalance responsibilities of users, platforms, and public authorities. They want to protect consumer rights online to increase transparency and accountability of the platforms, and to mitigate the risks of manipulation and disinformation. So, good intentions. Would not be very easy to enforce this, of course. Nobody knowing this sector can imagine that because the adoption of a law <coughs> in 2024, when the law will come fully into force, these problems will be eliminated. But in any case, according to the uh, uh, Commission that put forward the proposal to the European Parliament and the Council, the Commission said when issuing this proposal that for citizens there will be more choice and lower prices, and of course less, less exposure to illegal content, for providers of services that need to use the platforms, there will be legal certainty and harmonization of rules. For business users, again, more choice and lower prices, but also access to EU-wide markets through the platforms that will not be able to organize high barriers to entry of competitors or users of, of the platform. And for the society at large, this will imply greater democratic control and oversight over systemic platforms. Good intentions. I hope these intentions will be transformed into realities. But uh, being honest, I am not sure 
how difficult it will be to transform these good intentions written down in the law to the reality of markets in the coming years and decades. The uh, institutions, the economic agents covered by DSA, by the Digital Services Act, are intermediary services offering network infrastructure and online platforms, of course. And the obligations to online platforms written down in the Digital Services Act are transparency, respect to fundamental rights, complaint and redress mechanisms, control of abusive notices, reporting criminal offenses, and more and more. Very good intentions indeed. And for very large online platforms, for the superstars in this uh, sector, there are specific obligations. And the Digital Services Act consider that these uh, main online platforms, or very large online platforms, are those who are reaching more than 10% of the EU population among the users. So it means 45 million people as users of a platform, transforms the platform in a big one that is submitted to specific obligations. And those specific obligations are the need to put in place a compliance officer about the way the platform functions and abide by the rules, external risk auditing and public accountability, data sharing with authorities and researchers, the need to approve a code of conduct, and a crisis response cooperation. And for those who are not or will be not complying with these rules, there is in the Digital Services Act a regulation of sanctions in proportion to the uh, size of the sales or the turnover of these platforms uh, up to a maximum of 6% of annual turnover or 5% of average daily turnover. The other law, closely linked with competition rules as we knew it up until now. The Digital Markets Act has the purpose to ensure a level playing field for all the digital companies, regardless of their size. And, in particular, the Digital Markets Act, the DMA, established criteria to qualify as gatekeepers. Who will be the gatekeepers? Are those providers of core platform services with a significant impact in the single market, and core platform services are considered, and I give you some examples, online intermediation services, online search services, social networking services, video sharing platform services, interpersonal communication services, operating systems, cloud computing advices uh, or services, online advertising services, web browsers, so almost all the activities in this uh, uh, sector of uh, digital economy are considered or can be considered as core platform services. And this is one of the conditions if the platform develops some of those uh, core platform services with significant impact in the single market, in the EU single market, they can be considered gatekeepers. But also the operating of core platform services, which serves as an important gateway for users and, and uh, agents to reach other users or agents through the platform. They need not only to fulfill with these conditions, but also to enjoy an entrenched and durable position in the market with an annual turnover of at least 7.5 billion euros in each of the last three years, or as an alternative, a market capitalization to at least 
75 billion euros in the last financial year. And on top of this, the size of the turnover or the uh, size of the market, the cap of these companies, they have to provide services the same as the, in the Digital Services Act to at least 45 billion, uh, sorry, 25 monthly end users and more than 10,000 business users established in the single market during the last year. What it means to be considered a gatekeeper according to the Digital Markets Act? The gatekeepers have in the regulation some do's, things that they have to do, and some don'ts, things that are forbidden for them to do. Do's, what they have to do to easily uninstall, pre-install apps, or to allow to easily uninstall, pre-install apps, to allow end users to install third-party apps or app stores, substituting as an alternative the app stores pre-installed in the uh, devices, allow interoperability in message services, WhatsApp and others, allow end users to unsubscribe for core uh, uh, platform services of the gatekeeper, to allow the portability of data from one database to another database, to provide companies advertising in the platform with the necessary tools to verify how the ads are being presented, used, and managed by the gatekeeper, and to allow their business users to promote their offer and conclude contracts with their customers outside the platform that they are using. So these are the obligations for the gatekeepers. And what the gatekeepers cannot do, according to the DMA, they have to refrain from com combining and cross-using personal data to any other service. They cannot give preference to their own services against the services equivalent from the competitors using the same platform. It was the Google Shopping, the Google Shopping case. The, lay, the, the law prevents the gatekeepers that uh, they cannot avoid multi-homing, so belonging to two or more platforms for the use of uh, services, and switching to move from one platform to another platform, and they cannot use targeted advertisement knowing the preferences of the users, they can address the uh, publicity knowing the preferences and the uh, users and consumers uh, likes or don't like. So there are a lot of advantages in this regulation. They uh, consider that the business will be able to offer their services in a fairer environment, protecting them against abuses. Innovators and startups can have new opportunities to compete in this environment and to innovate. The consumers will have better services to choose. And the gatekeepers will keep all opportunities to innovate and offer services but will not be allowed to use unfair practices to do so. There are mechanisms of compliance, of course. I will not uh, go into the details because of the time. There are systems to uh, conduct, conduct sorry, market investigations to modify the conditions that the European Commission will impose to everyone of those platforms that will be considered gatekeepers according to the thresholds established. And the consequences of non-compliance, of course, there are fines. And also, and it's a particular point that has created big discussions more in the US than in this side of the Atlantic, 
There is a possibility to impose remedies if the gatekeeper is not complying with their obligations established by the law. And at the limit, the commission could decide to break up at the limit as ultima ratio, but is not eliminated the possibility to reach at the end the conclusion that the only possibility to avoid the lack of compliance with this regulation is to break up the company. So, how to enforce this? It's even more difficult to enforce this than to enforce the Digital Services Act, in my view. The Commission is trying to recruit experts, not only lawyers and economists, are the traditional components of the EU administration for the enforcement of competition, the Commission will need to hire experts, technical experts, knowing how these mechanisms function and how to correct the imperfections of these, uh, of these mechanisms. That is not only a legal question, but to fulfill the legal obligations, you need to find a way to be successful in this purpose, and this will require much more technical advice than is rightly now available. So, this will come into force. I really don't know if all the good intentions will be achieved in the first five years or in, the, in this decade. I really don't know. But what I know is that the under-enforcement of competition rules in a traditional way that we knew in the last years require this regulatory complement, even taking into account the difficulties to make enforceable the regulation. It's not only difficult to make enforceable the competition rules, but also these kind of regulations, even if they appear as a necessity to avoid the abuses and the distortions created by these superstars in this very specific uh, field of uh, the digital economy. Thank you very much.